tell you, Linda. Oh, great. Thank you very much for that lovely talk. Um, so uh, we have a little bit of time for some questions um, for you, Linda. I did notice in the chat there is a question for you, Martin, actually. I don't know if you want to take that. Well, the... well it's a question that... I... It's a question that I think Yolinda has just answered, actually, in many ways. Um, the, the first thing I must say, I'm afraid I'm a little bit of an outlier here, but um, people talk about SNPs, and I think this is a real shame because this is a misapplication of human genetics to bacteria. And whereas it works with them, um, with the uh, monomorphic organisms where you have very little variation, the whole point about a human SNP is it's a polymorphism with lots of identity around it. And you don't find that very much in bacteria. In fact, if you look at the gonococcal genome, it's hugely diverse, isn't it, Yolinda? You've got mutations everywhere. Um, you know, and, and in the Neisseria, it's almost saturated, it's almost not a base you can find that's not mutated. So, so what we mean is polymorphisms rather than single nucleotide polymorphism, which is a human genetics term, which I'm afraid has been slightly misused. In fact, many human geneticists get very frustrated by the way bacteriologists use it. So the question is, do you want to use polymorphisms? Well, of course, polymorphisms are the basis of variations of alleles as well. And all alleles is as a way of summarizing it. Do you want to use individual nucleotides on their own in the, in an analysis of something as recombinogenic as the gonococcus? Well, not really, because that's the problem. Um, individual polymorphisms work very well in the absence of recombination, but the moment you get lots of recombination, it, it becomes much more problematic. And I think um, uh, Yolinda showed very nicely, actually, that there is structure in the gonococcus in the face of lots of huge amounts of, of of mutation and recombination, there is still that is still organized in a structure. And the structure really, it's interesting how we've seen from both Yolinda's talk and Anna's talk, how mobile elements map on to the core genome structures that Adil was talking about. So in other words, the gonococcal population is highly, is, is based, you know, it's simple because it's based on an original strain that's diversified. It's, it's accumulated a lot of diversity, but that diversity is still structured for interesting reasons as well. Um, uh, and obviously, uh, um, just to finish my answer to you, Mustafa, obviously, if you were to use a whole genome MLST, which of course, Yolinda has just effectively um, presented, which would be the core plus the accessory, then obviously that gives you the maximum resolution. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Yolinda? Is that a... No, it's actually nice that we also added the pen genome scheme in MLSD. Yeah. So that's the core and the accessory together. Yeah. So that would be very nice to see if, if uh, this also cluster, if you have these clusters also uh, when yeah. using that scheme. Basically, the more genes you have, the more resolution you have. But it, the more the trouble is that then stable nomenclatures become difficult because even, as we've said with core genome, you end up with an, everything's an individual strain. So you have to way of grouping them. I hope that answers the question, but we can talk about that later. Um, if people, and there's, indeed, if people want to disagree with me. <laughs> there, there's a, a question from Alia. Uh, do you expect that genomic types which do contain plasmids would be able to carry them? Or would there be a genetic factor determining why some types carry plasmids and others don't? That sort of goes with um, Anna, Anna's talk earlier as well, isn't it? And, Something, something that they're trying to characterize actually as well to, to see whether there's some things that are, which are preventing some isolates from carrying plasmids as well. Um, Yolinda, do you want to add anything to that as well? Based on your data? Yeah, it was, it was quite interesting to see that some lineages uh, actually had a very small accessory genome while others uh, had, for example, a couple of plasmids and also other genes. Um, uh, so that yeah, maybe there is some restriction indeed in the in the genome that um, yeah, mm. I, but I don't know actually no. the, the answer. I I don't think that we know already. No, not, no, but that's yeah, Anna's uh, on the case, aren't you? <laughs> well, these are very very interesting and pertinent points. I mean, that's yes, an that's extremely right. good question. Understand. The extent to which this is selective or functional or a combination of the two is really questions we need to answer. Yeah. I think it's a bit of a surprise. I think both Yolinda and uh, I think all of you would agree that the, 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 the amount of structure that we found was a little bit surprising, you know, mm. given what we know about the biology of the organism. Definitely. We were quite surprised, weren't we, with the size of the accessory genome. Um, uh, yeah. So the small uh, size, you mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But when you think about the sort of the gonococcus and its lifestyle, it actually makes sense in that, in that 
respect, really. Uh, there's a question from Yvonne. Are these hypothetical proteins only found in GC? So I guess what you're, you're meaning is, uh, will we find them across a Neisseria genus? Um, yeah, that's, we've not looked at that yet. Uh, and that's something that we can, now it's in the database, they're defined in the database. And um, the database is nice genus wide. We'll be able to see actually whether there's um, distribution of them in other uh, species as well. It looks like Hank. Yeah. Uh, do, 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 Hank. Hello, Hank. Yeah. I always have questions. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's always great to have you on board, Hank. And you have such an encyclopedic knowledge as well, which is. Uh, that, that, Martin, as you know, that comes with age until you start <laughs> getting everything. Um, <laughs> So, Jolinda and Anna and Odile, I don't know, this is sort of a broad question, but now that you have sort of a core genome, accessory genomes, both plasmid and insertion, do you think it's now feasible to start um, asking um, serious evolutionary questions? Uh, I know we don't have a good clock, and that's one of the issues but to start trying to determine sort of when these elements might've been acquired, there'll be a lot of assumptions into that um, calculation, but maybe by rates of mutation and, and substitution, one could start to, to do that. Um, do you think that's worth doing or possible with your data sets? Anyone want to answer? Um, I think, it's, it's quite difficult, I think, because it recombines so much, isn't it, the gonococcus? I think it's quite going to be quite difficult to apply sort of molecular clocks uh, robustly. Um, certainly, we could look at maybe particular loci or, or one particular element and see whether, you know. Uh, we my, my thought is, and tell me, and I don't know how to do this, so it might not be feasible. Um, so the accessory elements right, must have been acquired at some point during the lifestyle, mm -hmm. right? And presumably not recently, because you're showing that they sort of are going along with the core genome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there should be measure, just internal measures of mutation frequency in the core genome versus the accessory genome mm -hmm. that will allow you to come back to a, a point where they diverge, right? if you have enough sequences. Mm. Uh, but with just the core genome and the recombination, I agree, you couldn't do it. Yeah. But I think with now the accessory genome, it might be possible to look at separate yeah. paths of evolution, if you will. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the yeah. problem I think, Hank, is that you're dealing with recombination, selection, diversification happening all at once. So um, th th there are sort of elements that are tractable to this. I, I think looking at the ribosome genes, for example, yeah. might be something because we know they're a bit more resistant yeah. to recombination than others. Um, but it really needs some fairly heavy duty statistical genetics to, to tease it out, um, I think. Yeah, and I would think a lot of sequences which yeah. Yeah. you're starting to develop. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, but no, there's certainly there's no doubt that there's a lot that these could be done with these data. And Definitely. I think once they're catalogued and you can, you know, the first thing is to try and catalog them, I think, which is what, you know, which is what I think that you, Linda and Anna and Adil have made a tremendous uh, advances in, in doing that. Um, and I think that has, the, yeah, sorry, cataloging across the nice tier genus as well would be quite interesting to see the distribution because we could compare them as well then with other species and actually see if this is something specific to the gonococcus or, um, and you know, gonococci and meningococci are quite similar gen genomically, you know, when you look at them phylogenetically there. So there's, and that really intrigues me, I think, that, that kind of why that is and why they lead to such different sort of phenotypes as well, really. And meningococci, as far as I know, don't carry so many plasmids. I don't know about the cryptic plasmid, Anna. Um, um, oh, did I inch? No. Um, we very occasionally get a meningococcus with a beta lactamis plasmid, which is. Mm. Which leads to the question of where they came from, which was yeah. presumably yeah. not from, not from, possibly not even from Nigeria. So that you know that yeah, um, no, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, conjugative. We've also found it, but it's very. Um, yeah. it, it, it's, it's it's not the same. It's yeah, missing things, a lot of things, and yeah, it's clearly not can't you clearly can't have them. Can't mm. have them. There's always the possibility that the plasmids we do find in Meninge have been bridged in through gonococci. 
Yeah. I mean, it's possible that the gonococcus has acquired them in the urogenital tract from other species. And then because the gonococcus yeah. occasionally colonizes the oropharynx, that, that that's how the meninges got them. There's, there's all sorts of interesting questions there, Hank, which I think we can start thinking about addressing. But they, they are, you know, there's, there's quite a few mysteries about these two bugs and why they're absolutely both yeah. similar and different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm also wondering with regard to evolution whether you can explain uh, evolution by looking at acquired, acquire, um, acquired, for example, prophages, be because we see this um, strong association with certain lineages. So maybe there is a restriction also in other lineages that they cannot acquire that specific profit. So you would expect, if you look at evolution, you would expect that it kind of spreads um, through the whole population, but that's not what we see. Yeah. Yeah. But again, you come back to this sort of chicken and egg problem. Is, 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 is the prophage the reason for the, the prophage association the reason for the, for the substructure or, or the consequence of the substructure? Those are very interesting yeah. questions, uh, I think. We're, and that fits in also with the, the Anna's work with looking at the restriction modification systems, of course, as well, which clearly must be playing some role in all of this. Yeah. Um. Great. Well, I guess we should carry on, finish with the last talk. Thank you very much uh, for everybody's questions and for your talks so far.